I am Ms. Hearn. Let's get started. Let's discuss the search for large prime numbers. Primes are used in coding theory. Prime numbers are the basis of security systems which allow us to transmit data in a secure way. As mathematicians have looked for larger and larger prime numbers, they've come up with several formulas and techniques for finding primes. No one has found the perfect method that always results in a prime number, however. It has been proven that there are an infinite number of primes. It was proven by Euclid using what we call a proof by contradiction. The way that Euclid proved it was by cr actually creating a formula that would theoretically generate prime numbers. This formula involves multiplying all the primes up to a certain value and then adding one to the result. These are called primordial numbers, and the primordial formula will result in prime numbers often, but not always. 211 is an example of a primordial prime, meaning that it's a prime number that results from using the primordial formula. So if you were asked if the primordial formula results in a prime number for the primes up to 7, they're asking you about that number, 211. Now we know from the sieve of Eratosthenes that in order to check if a number is actually prime, it's satisfactory to check all the possible factors of the number up to its square root. In this case, the square root of 211 is 14.5, and so we can look at the primes less than 14.5, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, and 13. If any of them divides 211, then it's composite. If none of them do, then we know it's prime. In this case, if you go through it and just divide it out, you'll find none of them goes in evenly, so 211 is prime. So that's why 211 is an example of a primordial prime. Another formula that's used to generate primes is m equals 2 to the n minus 1, or m sub n, meaning that uh, the Mersenne number for the number n is 2 to the n minus 1. It's been proven that if n is a composite number, meaning it has divisors, the Mersenne number for n is composite. It will not be prime. But if n happens to be a prime, then the Mersenne number might be prime or it might be composite. So if you were asked to find the Mersenne number for n equals 5, that's just asking you to plug into the formula 2 to the 5th minus 1. Now 2 to the 5th is 32 and 32 minus 1 is 31. And again, we don't have a guarantee that this formula will result in a prime, but it often does. And in this case, since 31 is a prime, we call it a Mersenne prime. Another formula that's been used is Fermat's formula for prime numbers. Fermat numbers are, again, an attempt at generating prime numbers, and the formula looks like this. 2 to the power of 2 to the n plus 1. No formula has ever been created that always results in a prime, but these are formulas that often do. The first five Fermat numbers up through n equals 4 happen to be prime. So let's go ahead and evaluate the Fermat number for n equals 4. That's saying to evaluate 2 to the power 2 to the 4th plus 1. Evaluate the number in the exponent first. So 2 to the 4th is actually 16. So this is 2 to the 16th plus 1. Then we evaluate 2 to the 16th. And that gives us 65,536. That gives us 65,536 plus 1, or 65,537. The more challenging part of this process is to actually determine whether this value is prime. I mean, that's a very large number, and large primes are really useful for coding theory. So let's talk about how to determine if 65,537 is actually prime. There are a lot of possible factors to check because it's a very large number. Now, to actually do it, it's going to take a bit of time. So what we're going to do instead is we're just going to answer this question. What's the largest potential prime factor that would have to be tested? So remember from the sieve of Eratosthenes that we learned that you really only have to check primes up to the square root of the number itself. In this case, the square root of 65,537 is about 256. So what we're going to do is we're going to check the numbers just below that and find the largest prime. 
that is close to that number. Even numbers are always going to be divisible by 2, so we can disregard those. We see 2 divides 256, and then anything that ends in a 5 is divisible by 5, so 255 is definitely not prime. 2 divides 254, so really the first number that we would check that we're not sure whether or not is prime is 253. But how are we going to determine if it's prime? We're going to use the same idea. We only have to check factors up to the square root of 253 that are prime. So, or potential factors. The square root of 253 is about 15.9. So we're going to have to check 3, 5, 7, 11, and 13 to see if 253 is prime. Now that might seem like a lot, but keep in mind that's better than having to check all the numbers less than 253. So if you go ahead and divide by all of those numbers, you're going to find that 11 actually divides 253. So we're going to have to keep going. So 2 divides 252. Now we're going to check 251. 251 could be prime. So we're going to repeat the process that we did before. We're going to take the square root of 251, which is 15.8. So we're going to, again, have to check 3, 5, 7, 11, and 13. None of those divides in evenly to 251. So 251 is actually the largest prime that you would have to check if you're going to confirm that 65,537 is prime. There are two more prime number formulas that you should be aware of. Euler's prime number formula, which is n squared minus n plus 41. Escott's prime number formula, which is n squared minus 79n plus 1601. What's special about both of these is that notice that they're not exponential, meaning the variable, the n that we're plugging in, is not in the exponent. These are actually polynomial formulas. And we know that Euler's prime number formula works for the first 40 numbers, but it, fa it fails for the first time at 41. Escott's prime number formula fails for the first time at 80. If you're interested in learning more about polynomial formulas for prime numbers, check out the number file video called Prime Spirals on YouTube.